Hi. So yeah, thank thank the organizers um, for um, yeah letting me speak at the conference, an online geometric analysis festival. Um, yeah. So so for for my talk today, um, it's the first part. So yeah, it's you know minimal searches and negatively curved few manifolds. Um, kind of several different contexts that. Um, are different, but that there will be kind of connections and analogies between. So the first part, we talk about minimal surfaces and quasi Fuchsian manifolds, so manifolds that are homeomorphic to like a surface times R and are constant curvature negative one and nice behavior at infinity. And kind of, yeah, what the minimal surfaces are like in those. Uh, in, in the second part, I'm going to talk about um, minimal surfaces in uh, uh, metrics of um, variable negative curvature and the underlying space is uh, homeomorphic to a closed hyperbolic manifold um, and, and some connections to homogeneous dynamics there. Uh, and then um, in the last part, I'm going to talk about um, relationship between uh, area and, uh, and scalar curvature um, uh, for um, uh, Remodeling metrics on on a closed hyperbolic manifold. So 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 yeah. So we started talking about um, quasi Fuchsian manifolds first. So what is a quasi Fuchsian manifold? So um, so quasi Fuchsian manifold. So. Just definition, quasi Fuchsian manifold. Uh, so it's just a hyperbolic structure, hyperbolic metric. On surface of genus bigger than one uh, times R. And uh, that R well behaved. At infinity. Okay, so I won't go into too much what that means, but I'll just mostly explain this by drawing pictures. So, I mean, what the well behaved at infinity means. So, right, so we have this, um, we're homing work to a surface times r. And so, what being well behaved at infinity means is so we have this kind of like uh, thinner part in the middle where, oh, sorry where um, kind of all the action's happening. But then uh, what being well-behaved in infinity means is, uh, is that um, it's, sort of, it's sort of flaring out uh, in, in such a way that we know exactly what's happening. So we know kind of, we can write down the metric explicitly um, and kind of all of the interesting stuff is happening in, uh, in this compact region in the middle um, that can be swept out by surfaces of, uh, Small area. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so that's what being quasi Fuchsian means. Um, I'll point out that, um, I mean, there are hyperbolic metrics on a surface times R uh, that are not quasi Fuchsian. So, for example, if you have a hyperbolic three manifold that fibers, it's clo a closed hyperbolic manifold that fibers over the circle. If you just take the cover um, uh, corresponding to um, the fiber subgroup, then you'll get um, a hyperbolic three manifold. It's only over to a surface times R. But that can be swept up by surfaces with like uniformly bounded area. So you won't have this like flaring out of the ends. Um, and there are a lot of other examples besides that. Uh, and so I'll just yeah, point that out because it'll be, um, uh, we'll kind of come back to thinking about that in, in a moment. Um, but yeah, so first, I guess I want to talk about um, I mean, one, one kind of theme for this talk is there'll be sort of like model cases um, that we're going to kind of try to understand everything else uh, in reference to and that will govern um, the things that we're able to prove like in the way of like um, different uh, like metric geometry inequalities that'll be like later in the talk but I mean uh, and yeah and then we'll just kind of like compare against these model cases so what what the model case is for um, uh, for these quasi Fuchsian manifolds 
so say model case, are uh, what are called Fuchsian manifolds. So this is just uh, how, how we get these are we just have um, pi one of the surface uh, and then including into PSL2R just um, by taking the, the holonomy of the hyperbolic structure, right? Um, so pi one of the surface is acting um, uh, by isometries on, on its universal cover, which is the hyperbolic plane. So that gives us like a map, or it gives us a map from um, uh, pi one of the surface to um, to PSL2R, the isometries of two-dimensional hyperbolic space. And so we can include this into uh, PSL2C, which is uh, the group of orientation preserving isometries of, of three dimensional hyperbolic space. Okay. And uh, yeah, and then if we just mod out by, uh, I mean, the fundamental group of the surface acting on uh, three dimensional hyperbolic space by isometries, then we get it's like Fuxi manifolds that have a totally geodesic surface in the middle. Um, and uh, we can write down the metric explicitly and um, and yeah and so that's this is this is the model case um right but like in, in general though um uh i mean quasi fuxian manifolds can be like very far from i mean uh this this like this fuxian uh fuxian case so uh so i'll just kind of say the main the main kind of general classification theorem here, which is um, due to Alfors and Bears. Uh, so, and probably other people who forgetting or just, yeah, I don't know the history of this that well. Um, but yeah, so the, what they show is that the space of quasi Fuchsian, so abbreviated as QF, Manifolds is uh, can be parameterized by a product of, of type newer spaces. So, uh, what does this mean? So, so the type newer space surface is just um, space of all hyperbolic structures on it. So it's a marked hyperbolic structures, right? So, all the different hyperbolic metrics you can have, but. Um, with like a marking of the final group. Um, and uh, what where this is coming from is if you like think back to this picture I drew, uh, you have two ends. And for each of the ends, there's a way to um, uh, constantly associate, um, or there's a way to associate a high rock or conformal structure. Uh, I mean, to each of these ends, right? And so kind of specifying conformal structure is the same as specifying hyperbolic metric by um, uniformization theorem. Um, and so uh, what what the two points in Tyke Miller space are, uh, where like Tyke bar just means uh, different orientation since we kind of have the top one and the bottom one, and that doesn't really matter. But um, but the, the point is we, we get these two um, kind of the conformal structures at infinity, you're kind of a unique like asymptotic conformal structure. By which you can see by writing down the metric explicitly um, near infinity. Um, this this gives us uh, two, um, uh, yeah, I mean, kind of hyperbolic structures that are telling us what's happening in infinity. And then the remarkable theorem that uh, Alfred and Barris proved is that you can actually recover um, the whole hyperbolic metric in, in the interior um, from kind of its these two. Um, uh, conformal structures at infinity for, for both ends. Uh, and, and conversely, it's possible to um, give an A2 conformal structures, find some quasi Fuchsian manifold that uh, has those two um, conformal structures as, as its boundaries at infinity, like interpolates between them or uh, connects them. Uh, right. So, yeah, so there's, yeah, this great theorem by Alfors and Bears. Um, and then, yeah, so of course, I mean, quasi Fuchsian manifolds are. Really important in hyperbolic three manifold theory, and um, which I don't really have time to say that much about. But um, and and have just been kind of studied 
for their own sake too. Um, uh, and I mean, one, one thing that people study are kind of the many different measures of complexity that uh, you can have, right? Just kind of trying to understand, look, we have this like abstract description from outboards and barriers, but just try, trying to understand what, um, uh, what, the, what the space looks like in, in a more hands-on way. So I'll say it's many different measures of complexity. Okay, so, I mean, one thing is you can look at the volume of the convex core, right? So it's kind of said uh, earlier, you, um, there's this kind of part of the quasi fuchsian manifold, like in the middle where, where all the action's happening and it turns out there's the canonical uh, maximal um, convex, or sorry, minimal uh, convex subset of quasi fuchsi manifold that uh, carries the fundamental group. So that kind of the um, inclusion of pi one in that convex subset um, includes the pi one in the group, right? So there's a sort of convex set in the middle where that carries the fundamental group where all the action's happening. Um, and so one way of thinking about how complicated quasi fuchsi manifold is, is just like how big that set is. Like what's, what's the volume sense, I mean. Volume is a good measure of complexity in hyperbolic manifold theory, but I mean, quasi fuchsian manifolds have infinite volume, but this is kind of a, the finite volume uh, subset of it that has all of the important information. Um, right, so you can also look at the Hausdorff dimension of the limit set. Um, and I won't say too much about what this is, but it's if you take the universal cover of a quasi fuchsian manifold, you have um, uh, some of a group of your surfaces is, is acting on three dimensional hyperbolic space. Um, and I mean, the Hausdorff dimension, and, I mean, the limit side is kind of capturing what the um, kind of the dynamical uh, large scale complexity of, of what, what the um, of, of that action. And so that's, that's one way to. Um, uh, to talk about how complicated the quasi fuchsian manifold is. Um, and then finally, you can just look at the, the complexity of the, the surfaces that it contains. For example, the most natural study, class of surfaces to study are just critical points of the area functional or, or mineral surfaces. And so um, you can also, yeah, you can just look at like how complicated are the, are the mineral surfaces in it. Right, so those are three different ways to measure the complexity. Um, of a quasi fuchsi manifold. And so I'll come back to kind of, uh, yeah, come back to these different measures of complexity in, in a moment. But um, first, I'm going to say, say this question that um, is kind of one of the starting points for, for my work here. Um, and that will end up relating to uh, these different measures of complexity, although uh, it might not be clear at first how that will happen, but I'll explain. Uh, and so one natural thing to ask is like whether uh, there's any way to, uh, to parameterize uh, quasi fuchsian space uh, from within. So based on kind of information in its interior and not like the at conformal at the two conformal affinities from like from the L force barrier theorem that I just said. Um, right, and so uh, this, this paper that Karen Lundek wrote as a theorem which um, I'll state now, which I um, view as uh, a, a partial answer to this question. Um, is the following. So yeah, I'll say, say the theorem now. So if you just have some um, sigma inside of a hyperbolic um, manifold that's homeomorphic to a surface of genus bigger than one times R. Um, and then, uh, Right, and then this this 
the sigma that includes into m, uh, if that's, sorry, if this is, uh, minimal surface, with maximum principal curvature, which I'll call lambda naught, less than one, then first we know M is quasi Fuchsian, right? So if you remember what I was saying at the start that, I mean, there can be all these other higher block metrics on surface MSR that are not necessarily quasi Fuchsian that are degenerate. Um, don't kind of have nice behavior at infinity, but if this is satisfied, you know, M is quasi Fuchsian. Um, and uh, and it's determined by the hyperbolic structure is determined by one, um, the conformal class of sigma in just its induced metric on um, uh, as as a minimal surface inside m and two um a holomorphic quadratic differential uh that's equivalent to its uh, second fundamental form, right? So I won't really say the details of um, how you get homomorphic quadratic differential from the second fundamental form, but basically by the fact that you're in constant curvature um, and that your minimal surface, um, kind of the gauss kadazi equations work out really nicely in it. Uh, it ends up being the case that um, you can just write down a homework quadratic differential that, of which the second fundamental form is basically the, the real part of. So it's, um, there's this nice thing you're able to do with that. Um, so, so yeah, so this is kind of, I mean, this is like saying we can part, parameterize um, part of quasi Fuchsian space by, uh, by just a point in technical space, right? So the conformal class of the mineral surface and then uh, holomorphic quadratic differential, um, which is like a point in the cotangent space of, of tight mirror space. Um, yeah, and so, so right. So for example, I mean, uh, we have like this like Fuchsian manifolds where um, like the surface, the minimal surface sigma, um, uh, it's just this totally geodesic surface. Um, and so in this case, the homomorphic quadratic differential is zero. Um, but there are a lot of other examples where, um, yeah, basically as long as we kind of, uh, yeah, we can sort of perturb off of the, the model case, the Fuchsian case, and like keep going, like just kind of fix the conformal class and then choose some homomorphic quadratic differential and just like multiply that by uh, some like real number T starting at zero and increasing it. Um, and then, what kind of Umbex theory lets you do is like build a quasi Fuchsian manifold in which uh, uh, kind of there's unique minimal surface from the conformal class that you started with. Um, and you can sort of keep going until uh, the principal curvatures get larger than the ambient curvatures, right? So that's what the meaning of like the principal curvatures being less than one is. is it's like if, you're, uh, if your principal curvatures are, are smaller than the ambient curvatures, then, um, uh, then, then stuff breaks down. Right, and so um, there's kind of another part of the theorem that I should have said, so I'll say it now. Um, and I mean, sigma is actually, uh, we didn't assume anything about whether it was embedded or not, it could have been immersed, um, but uh, sigma is, is actually embedded um, inside, inside M and it's, it's unique, it's unique mineral surface. Um, and uh, unique. Uh, in M. Right. So there's kind of two directions to the Umbeck theorem. I guess I only say to kind of the direction like 
if you have this mineral surface, the principal curvature is less than one. There's some JD that that that's that holds where you can kind of recover the whole hyperbolic structure from information attached to the mineral surface. But there's kind of another direction where you just kind of specify the mineral surface and a homomorphic quadratic differential as long as have the formal principal curvatures are less than one in absolute value, then you can um, just write down metric on M where, uh, where M is quasi Hamiltonian. Okay, so just to say a little bit about like how, what kind of goes into your proof, um, uh, I'll, um, I'll just, yeah, kind of draw a picture quick and just say, so see what I mean? So, um, what's kind of happening if you have this minimal surface with principal curvatures less than one in absolute value is you can just flow out normally and you have these kind of foliations on, on both sides uh, by, um, uh, by strictly mean convex surfaces, right? And so just kind of using these foliations, you can um, rule out the existence of other minimal surfaces. Uh, so you kind of really, you just have one minimal surface in the middle. Um, and uh, yeah, so kind of having principal curvatures less than one um, lets you write down the metric explicitly, right? And so kind of M as, as in the theorem uh, definition are, uh, are called um, almost Fuchsian, right? So they're, when you have this like minimal surface with principal curvatures less than one in absolute value. So um, the first question that uh, you can ask here is, um, uh, what if the largest principal curvature uh, is, is equal to one? Okay, so, um, so we, we assume that, I mean, for the theorem that I just said, the principal curvature said to be less than one, but what if we don't have strict equality? Uh, or yeah, if we have some point where the principal curvature is equal to one. Um, right, so if uh, sigma is some minimal surface inside M uh, and yeah, it's maximum principal curvature. Is, is equal to one. Okay, and so I'll just kind of say the theorem that um, uh, Zeno Wong um, and 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 myself proved, which is the following. So that I mean, if you have some minimal surface. With principal curvatures um, bounded above by one, but equal to one somewhere, uh, then um, uh, and with the same kind of setup as as for the theorem, then um, with m as above and and so forth, um, then m actually has to be geometrically finite. Okay, so you can't. You can have something like um, like the like an M that corresponds to a closed hyperbolic from you know, the fibers of this circle. Right? So you can have these degenerate ends that don't have nice behavior infinity if um, uh, if if you have some minimal surface with principal curvatures less than or equal to one. So we we go to the, the boundary of what what Ullenbeck does in your paper. Um, yeah, and the reason so the reason you can't say quasi Fuchsian here. Um, is there these things called axonal parabolics where you sort of have these like wrinkle and cusps. So I won't really talk about that, but you should think of geometrically finite as being like pretty close to quasi-Fuchsian, um, except you can have these like cusps at infinity. So you still have kind of a finite value and convex core and you're pretty well behaved, but um, it seems possible that um, you can actually have these like rank one cusps at infinity. Um, so I won't really talk anymore about that, but that's, that's what this geometrically finite means here and, and why I can't just say quasi Fuchsian. Um, and we think this is like a necessary uh, thing that needs to be, um, uh, 
yeah, we think kind of the conclusion here is sharp that like this can actually happen where these right call cusp infinity, but I won't talk anymore about that. But uh, I'll just say a couple of the main ingredients of the proof and like say how, how this goes. Um, right, so the strategy is, I mean, we kind of lift everything to the universal cover. So we have the lift of the mineral surface to the universal cover. So we have this like properly embedded disc that lifts the, the mineral surface. It's like sitting inside three dimensional hyperbolic space. And then we have the pi one of the group acting by covering transformations, pi one of the surface group acting by covering, pi one of the surface acting by covering transformations. Right, and so we kind of do is we, we flow out normally and we can write down the metric explicitly. Um, this is a way to just kind of, yeah, flow out normally. And I mean, yeah, just taking out of um, normal coordinates at the lift of minimal surface sigma. Um, and then this gives us a map to, um, I mean, from sigma to the boundary at infinity, which you think of three dimensional hyperbolic space as the point gray ball, is just going to be like the, um, the round sphere. So that's kind of the natural conformal gratification of uh, three-dimensional hyperbolic space. It's, it's just the, the two-sphere. Um, and so what we end up looking at is kind of this map from our lift lift our mineral surface to the, the sphere of infinity. And we want to kind of control, get some control on that in terms of the geometry of the mineral surface. And so what we use is um, uh, there's this uh, Kobe one-fourth theorem, uh, but for uh, maps that aren't conformal, but Conformal up to some error, so quasi conformal. Um, so they uh, kind of preserve angles up to some error. Uh, uh, and yeah, it seems due to a style gearing. And so this basically lets us, uh, so that the map kind of to um, restricted to part of the surface to the sphere of infinity will end up being quasi conformal kind of the geometry, knowledge of the geometry of the surface will tell us that. Um, and um, we can control what's happening at infinity using, knowing that's quasi-conformal using this theorem that is solid gearing proof, which is Kobe 1-4 theorem, but for quasi-conformal maps. So I'll remind you, like the Kobe 1-4 theorem for holomorphic maps just says that like if you have a uh, injective holomorphic map from the unit disk, the complex plane that sends zero to zero, then it has to contain all, uh, Contain like the disk of radius one fourth um, centered at uh, at the origin. So, um, and then for quasi conformal maps, kind of the same same is true, but up to an error for the one fourth that depends on what the quasi conformal constant. So I won't say any more about that. And then the other key thing is is that there's this classification of um, hyperbolic three manifolds. That are uh, homeomorphic to a surface times R uh, due to um, Banahan and also um, Canary, uh, Brock, uh, Minsky, and probably a bunch of other people I'm forgetting. Um, where, yeah, so you give kind of. Um, this is general structure uh, theory, theory for um, uh, for um, Kleinian surface groups um, that um, so just yeah the groups acting on the universal cover that we mod out by to get a surface times r um, so just abstractly there pi one of a surface, but there's lots of different ways for pi one of a surface to act on three dimensional hyperbolic space. But um, there's kind of this nice classification that's due to um, uh, a bunch of people that uh, we kind of appeal to. Um, um, and that's the really important uh, ingredient in, in our proof. So, right, so I'll just, I'll say a couple of corollaries. So, um, so they're kind of, mm, so we sort of have these like quasi fuchsian manifolds that have minimal surfaces principal curvatures equal to one somewhere that are kind of on the boundary of this almost fuchsian space that Kieran Ulbeck defined, um, separating it from kind of the rest of the quasi fuchsian manifolds that can be in general kind of much wilder. And so knowing what happens with like the principal curvatures equal to one, it kind of tells us not just about the almost fuchsian manifolds, but um, it 
or kind of gives us information on, on those by just kind of like letting us compactify space almost we've seen intervals, but also tells us about um, like what's happening beyond almost we've seen space um, on the other side and gives us some gap theorems. So I'll just say these two corollaries. So if, um, right, so if we have our principal curvatures uh, at most one, then we get a uh, uniform upper bound on the volume of the convex core. Right, so so previous estimates for the volume of the convex core, they there were there's like some stuff that um, Dino Wang and Bao Wang did, uh, like estimating volume of the convex core in terms of lambda naught, but they blew up as lambda naught approached one, but um, kind of knowing that we have this nice compactification of almost weak scene space, we're able to say that um, uh, yeah that we have this this uniform bound on uh, on the volume of the convex core, um, uh, and it's kind of similar statements for other measures of the complexity of quasi Fuchsian manifold being kind of uniform bounds, like for that, this is also a statement for like the Hauser dimensional limit set, kind of along these lines. Uh, and then kind of a corollary from the from the other side, like a gap theorem, um, is that there exists some epsilon that is just going to depend on the the topological topological type of the surface, um, so just the genus, uh, such that um, for every uh, closed hyperbolic three manifold that fibers over the circle with fiber um, homeomorphic to sigma g. Um, any uh, minimal surface. Isotopic to the fiber uh, has uh, its largest principal curvature at least one plus epsilon, right? So it's, it's gap theorem for the geometry of um, uh, hyperbolic three manifolds um, that uh, like really kind of. What, what's happening for this corollary is where we're taking the cover of the closed hyperbolic manifold corresponding to the, the fiber subgroup. So we get this degenerate hyperbolic manifold. And so kind of um, we're able to, because we like understand what happens at lambda nine equals one um, and using kind of, well, yeah. Um, knowing that we understand what happens at, or using what we, uh, using that we know what happens at lambda nine equals one, um, uh, we can say that um, kind of, that kind of like soft compactness argument uh, that there's this universal lower bound for kind of the geometry or complexity of um, what minimal surfaces or of minimal surfaces in um, fibered hyperbolic parameters. Uh, cool. Um, right, so let's see how we're doing time. All right, so. I'm gonna start talking about, uh, I'm gonna switch to variable curvature um, now. And, uh, but what I'm gonna talk about will also connect to what I just kind of talked about. It's kind of almost Fuchsian manifold theory. Um, yeah, so I'll talk about that for a little while and take a break. Uh, so, so, okay, so switching, switching directions a little bit. Um, Variable curvature. So if M is equal to uh, H3 mod gamma is a closed uh, hyperbolic three manifold, right? So that's M now is a closed hyperbolic three manifold. And the um, Grassmann bundle of tangent two points to M. So this is just the, um, it's just, is the bundle of of um, unoriented uh, tangent uh, two points to them. Okay. Uh, 
so right, so the grass the grass model, uh, it, it has like natural has natural foliation. Which I'll call um, F. Uh, by um, uh, tangential lifts of um, immersed totally geodesic points. All right, so how does it happen? So a okay, universal cover is three-dimensional higher box space, right? So we have all these totally geodesic two-dimensional planes inside there. And so if we just project all of those down to our closed hyperbolic area manifold under just the covering map, then we get, um, then those will foliate uh, uh, the, the, the grass and model tangent two planes instead if we, lift these surfaces by their, their tangent two place. Um, yeah, so, so another way to think about that is, um, I mean, for each, for each point in M and then for each tangent two point M at, at, uh, at that point, we can kind of take the image of that under the exponential map to get uh, an immersed totally geodesic plane inside M, right? And so kind of for each tangent two point, there's this unique immersed totally geodesic plane through M. And um, if we kind of lift that by its tangent two planes to uh, uh, the Grassman model of tangent two planes M, then we get this, uh, this foliation. Um, uh, that's analogous to um, the foliation of the um, unit tangent bundle to M by, um, by closed geodesics, right? So um, that's, that's something to think about here um, as an analogy that, uh, will return to you. Um, so, so this theorem, this great theorem that, that Radner and Shaw proved is that uh, every every leaf of of F, um, which I'll yeah also call F G hype to just say it's kind of dependence, in any case, dependence on the Herbach metric, um, is either a closed surface or, or else it's uh, dense in um, the grass and monopen the two points, right? So these immersed planes kind of satisfy the strong rigidity where either they go everywhere or they close up to a nice surface, nice like close immersed surface. So um, yeah, so let's get this kind of from Radner's theorems, kind of viewing um, the immersed planes as they end up being kind of the same as uh, orbits of PSL2 are acting on the frame model. Um, and then yeah, Shaw also has kind of a way of um, proving this in, in a bit different. Uh, of a way, but right. So this is a great picture in constant curvature. And so, I mean, one question you can ask is there, is there any variable curvature analog of this? Um, right, and so that's, um, yeah, so in the second part of the talk, I'll uh, say a, uh, a variable curvature analog of, of this. So yeah, so I'll stop the first part of first part of my talk now. Um,